Hello, welcome to the next uh, Tampa Bay IIBA Lunch and Learn, sponsored by the Tampa Bay chapter of the IIBA. Um, Clifford Gray has been good enough to organize all these. And the series started off with 20 excellent uh, presentations about data by Richard Frederick. So hopefully we will keep the good information going. So today what I wanted to talk about was more on the process side. And um, Every project goes through a number of phases and the challenge at some point, particularly as the processes and the engagements get more complicated, is how to keep track of everything you're doing and make sure it all makes sense and make sure it actually addresses the customer's problem and also make sure that everything gets done. So who am I? I'm a guy that's done uh, computer simulation for 30 years. These are a couple of simulation demos I put together of work similar to what I've done. These are written in JavaScript, so you can put them together in any way you want. I can talk about these in more detail in a future week. Those are the industries I've worked in, the applications I built simulations in other software uh, systems for, and some of the architectural considerations. So literally I started programming in um, the spring of 1981. So I've been at this for 40 years in one uh, form or another. So I've been around and I've seen a few things and hopefully I'll be able to share a few insights I've picked up. So the framework that I developed over doing all this work, and it's inspired by a number of sources, is basically what you see here. And I can go into each of these steps in more detail sometime in the future. But basically, it's pretty simple. Uh, first of all, can you see my mouse? cursor somebody type in in the chat if not i'll know to just talk excellent you're good okay so um you start with project planning at the beginning and do a project close at the end so that's pretty standard um then you figure out the intended use of the system or the work you're going to put together, what you're going to do. It's also known as the problem statement, the kickoff, the charter, whatever you want to call it. Because I've spent so much time doing simulation, the question is always, what are you going to use it for? So that's why I choose this particular language. It's not carved in stone. You can use any language you want. Um, this next phase, assumptions, capabilities, and so on. That really takes place uh, not 
specifically here it's a little more diffuse and I'll talk about that sometime in the future. The conceptual model is where you figure out what's going on now. It's the as a state. It's where you do your discovery and much of your data collection and figure out what's going on now. Then you figure out where you're going to get the data from. And you may also collect most of it at this point. Then you start doing requirements. And that's really what this is all about. Richard talked about that quite a lot. So as opposed to the as is state, if you have one, uh, in the conceptual model, the requirement starts talking about the to be state, but in an abstract way. And there are at least two kinds of requirements. The traditional two are functional, what the system does, what it's supposed to do, and non-functional, which is what the system is, the qualities it has, plus maintenance and governance, which is an important part of a system, especially when you hand it over to a customer. I should also point out that many people work in house uh, doing this BA and other type of work. I've usually been an external consultant or vendor. So we're always, uh, my company and I are always going into other people's shops, figuring out their processes building them some new capability or improving the capabilities they already have. So maintenance and governance is uh, an important part of that when you're um, giving them something new and then mostly walking away from it, at least from the day-to-day -day point of view. Then we get into design, which is the detail to be staying. Implementation is actually building and deploying the thing and that test. Um, there are zillions of kinds of tests that you can do. I'll talk about those in the future. And um, they come, there are two aspects of testing. One is verification, which is figuring out if your program actually works. And then the fitness for purpose is the validation. And that talks about whether what you built actually addresses the customer's need. So the to be a little more pithy, it's does what I built work? Does it solve the problem? Then acceptance is, uh, goes with uh, accreditation. If you hear B, B, and A, that's the A. So we should be aware of all aspects of the project, how we're going to do things from the beginning, even if every participant is not involved in every part of it. So different people will be, come to the four in different phases, BAs are more involved in the beginning part and in the overall conduct of every engagement. Uh, programmers and testers will be later in the implementation part. 
you should understand and plan for how it's all going to happen. DevOps is one approach, but it's not the only one. If you know anything about it, it's really kind of a continuous integration and deployment approach that has a built-in, highly formalized test schema. But the point is that the entire process is kind of built up right from the beginning. So if we want to simplify this, let's cut out some of the not important stuff and just stick with the main things we're going to do. So we're going to figure out what problem we want to solve figure out what's going on now, do something about the data, figure out what we need, figure out how we're going to address what we need, go ahead and build it, then test it. So you'll see those colors in those labels going forward here a lot. So let me say something about data. Um, I have really not much to add uh, beyond the brilliant stuff that Richard has said for the last um, 20 weeks or so. But um, I do identify as we're going through um, all these phases, four different kinds of data. The first kind of data has, um, basically describes the system. What are your processes? And how many of them are there? What size are they? That kind of thing. They tend to be more qualitative, and there aren't very many of them. Um, you usually find this out during discovery as you're building the conceptual model. Data collection is where you get the operating data, uh, how the system works statistically over time. It talks about the items that you're processing within the system. The next is control data, and there are two aspects of that. One is um, the business rules and KPIs that have to be embodied in the system somehow. And the other are just the random variables that the programmers put together to control program flow and to instantiate the algorithms that USBAs uh, design for them based on customer needs. And then the uh, system generates a lot of data in terms of results, produced output, and operating data, which you'll use. A lot of times here, you can find this presentation on my website. It's in the Reveal JS framework. So it's a direct JavaScript and HTML web page by itself. Um, and there are often links to detailed blog posts within that. So any place you see this, there will be one or more longer blog post. All right, so if we're doing waterfall, we basically march through all the phases in order. That's the theory. And if you really organize, super organized, super lucky, and the project isn't too complex, you may be able to do something that looks like that. 
in the real world, as many of you know, if not all of you, it's generally more complex than that and often a lot more complex. If you're doing Agile and Scrum, you basically have an, uh, what we see next, which is figuring out what the problem is, figuring out what's going on in identifying requirements, putting them in a backlog, working with the product owner and stakeholders to uh, prioritize that backlog, and then pulling off items one by one or in groups to do the second half of the process. A hybrid kind of does a overall high level design, but then when you implement it, you end up doing the design implementation and test in little cycles in what looks like Scrum. I think a lot of uh, frustration people have with Scrum and Agile is that what you're trying to do a Scrum process and lay all these ceremonies and all unnecessary gyration onto essentially a waterfall situation. There's a uh, good reason to do it this way, but just be aware of the issue. Um, your overall design that you're imposing on the thing can come from a number of sources. And an important one of those is um, that your solution that you're applying, particularly if you're an outside vendor, tends to be in a fairly packaged form. So one place I worked back in the early to mid 90s, we did file net document imaging systems. So our solutions were always going to be find out what business process you have and then figure out how to uh, create a document handling system that auto automates away most of um, the physical movement of the documents. That's one aspect of the automation that Richard talked about. If you're going to improve a, an existing project or an existing process, you'll basically do however, whether it's waterfall or scrum and agile, you'll have a conceptual model phase where you figure out what's going on. So that's kind of standard. That's where you do most of your discovery and data collection. If you're doing a project to build a simulation for a certain purpose, that is the project. So that's not uh, anything different. But if you're using a simulation as part of designing something else, like if you're designing a paper mill or a nuclear power plant or um, some kind of business process, you'll build the simulation to prove out the design and continue refining during the implementation. So it's its own project embedding in a larger project. And the last variation that's major that I'll talk about is if you're doing a new project from scratch and there is no existing project to build a conceptual model of, in that case, you start out doing the requirements 
and then the conceptual model uh, grows inside the design phase. So what we're really doing, whatever uh, you go through, is you are working on one phase, going around and around with the customer, documenting things until you all agree, and then you go to the next phase. And it's key to have that feedback and clarification and correction so you don't get um, too far off uh, target with your activity. Really, most of one Scrum and Agile are supposed to be, and really all they are at the end of the day is a formalized way of getting people to talk to each other, which is what they should be doing anyway, right? So it keeps them engaged uh, very tightly through every phase of the project. You never want to just have a bunch of people figure something out, go off in a direction, come back together at the end, stick it all together and see if it works. If you keep everybody engaged in interacting all through the process, you're not likely to have a big disaster at the end. So I have this hot take that Agile and Scrum are a bit of a scam. Um, if you're trying to do it as an exact formal by the book thing, like in one of these from training courses I've taken, most of the stuff in there I can tell you is generalized stuff having to do with software and really misses the main point is not part of Agile and Scrum per se. There's a link here to a terrific video by one of the guys of a talk he gave at, I think, the GoTo conference about six years ago. And he was one of the guys talking about, he actually helped create the Agile Manifesto back in the late 90s. And he says, basically, Agile is dead. It's about 40 minutes. I highly recommend you get that uh, look seen. And uh, it's on YouTube. And he says, basically, what I'm saying, find out what's going on, and then adjust. That's all he says for 40 minutes. There's another way to think about the same process, and that is that it's a customer feedback cycle, right? So you do everything, get feedback correct, and move forward. Also, why these backward links are here is because if you realize that you missed something, you can go back and add. So how do we keep all that work? I mean, if you have a large project, you can have hundreds of requirements, if not thousands. And you have a lot of implementation and testing and matching up to things you've discovered in the existing process. How do we make sense of it? One of our viewers asked a question a couple of weeks ago. How do we ensure that we're identifying requirements that solve the actual problem? And here's a tool. This is the point that we're trying to make of the whole thing, the requirements traceability matrix. So what you want to do is come up with some kind of 
representational structure, and I'll talk about that a little bit, that links all your items back and forth in both directions through all the phases. So you start with the intended use. This is the problem you're trying to solve. Then you do all the everything you identify in the conceptual model. Um, and then you generate all your requirements. And the requirements actually have to point to something in the conceptual model. Particularly if uh, you're doing a simulation, but it's true of anything. Now, um, there are a couple of exceptions to this. One is that if you find something in the system, you don't need to worry about something that'll go away. It can die at the conceptual model phase and not be matched by a requirement. In contrast, or the flip side of that, if the new solution is going to add something new, uh, we'll have a requirement that doesn't link backwards to a conceptual model um, item, but it should link back to the intended view. So uh, the design has to link to um, every item in requirements. Implementation has to link to everything in design. Everything in the implementation has to be tested. And if you pass all of those tests, then you get acceptance. If you remember, um, if you note these question marks here, that is an indication that maybe you've uh, been in a leader phase and identified something new that needs to be put into the former phase. There are two more features of this concept. One is non functional requirements that are sort of injected at their uh, requirements level. And those are qualities that the solution or the system needs to have. And they're kind of your independent uh, requirements or item for each phase for how you as a company, organization, or team, or uh, sometime industry standards, how you're gonna do different things. So those are kind of independent. Another aspect of identifying requirements is that sometimes they may come in in the form of epics, and they might be broken down into features and tasks, and they create implementation items that then get tested. So there's a tension between things we need to do in project management and assign the actual work in the conceptual breakdown of all the ideas in the project. This is always going to happen. It can basically happen anywhere um, in the broad sweep of the middle of the project. And uh, there are a lot of reasons to do these uh, breakdowns. So anything that requires a different kind of expertise, if you're making a video game and you need um, to put together the final boss character, say, you need a mesh, you need colors, you'll need behaviors, you'll need movement, 
you'll need strategy, health, clean values, and so on. So this methodology kind of works for any field. How do we track this stuff? Any way that works, it's a program. The more formal you want, or the bigger the um, scope and scale and complexity of the project, the more formal you should be. You should, uh, the situation should be uh, viewable by as many people as possible. There are a lot of ways you can do things. Um, items in different phases may uh, be described differently. You need to be able to represent different kinds of relationship as we saw on the diagram on the previous page, right? This one. And a consistent coding system should be used to give further context to each item. So uh, here's one way you might think about this. Again, there's a tension between representing assignable and trackable tests and figuring out where they fit into if you, uh, the framework. So um, here you have a traditional scrum board where you're marching um, items from beginning uh, to the end within each phase, right? And here everything in intended use has an A code, conceptual model B, then C through F going forward. And then later on, we show links back to items in the previous phase. And that shows how everything is hooked together. Uh, the, some requirements will be non-functional requirements that don't have previous links. So that shows the status of items in each phase. This kind of uh, representation shows how the items all link to each other across all the phases. And again, this is kind of hard to deal with if you have hundreds of these. But that, uh, this is just a conceptual representation. Again, you can see that items here link back, link back, link back. That's a new non-functional requirement. And you can also have situations where an item here links back to multiple items in a previous phase. So here you have a one to many um, going from A to B and then D2 and D3 map to E2 as a many to one. And then there can be zillions of tests. So this shows items and connections and their relationship to each other but not the status, but you could certainly add that in a graphical or a textual way. Um, I like backward links. I've written a lot of programs that uh, do things like this. Um, they're kind of a graph database. And often when you implement them, only going one way is really easier.
sometimes items can be created automatically, particularly for implementation items that are going to spawn off certain kinds of tests. And we can talk about that sometime in the future. Now, there are two definitions of done for all these. One is a, a, a definition in a customer agreement of each item themselves. And then the other is everything downstream also being done that's connected. So the implementation is done in one uh, respect when the implementer finishes working on it and submits it, but it isn't really done till it passes all the tests. There are, uh, you could create a uh, Jira implementation or setup that embodies all this information, or you can do the beginning phases in separate documents and then only use JIRA for the trackable implementation item. The concept is the same, but um, the implementation is a little simpler to grasp. Back in this situation, a lot of times when people are using JIRA, they have individual tasks that march across the board from column to column. And uh, the key uh, in doing a more complex representation like this is that when things go into JIRA, they don't really move. They just stay there and get done. And then they link to something that may or may not be new in the next phase. That's the real trick to it. And that's about all I have for today. Does anyone have any questions? One and two, if you uh, want to ask any questions or contact me or join me on LinkedIn, then here's my information. You can find these slides on my website on the portfolio page under presentations, it's the fourth item and uh, click on the heading or the link and scroll down and you'll find all the presentations I'm going to be doing as we make them happen. Feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you to Cliff and the IIBA for facilitating all this. And thank you to Richard for um, his help and guidance and inspiration. And hopefully we will see you in a future week. Cliff, do you have anything to say? Nope. Um, actually, uh, if you want to post, uh, we can put out a, a message on uh, the meetup for the recording. If we want to make that available, that's totally up to you. No, um, I will. And uh, I will put links to everything on the meetup page. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a great weekend, guys.